Father, I pray that today you speak to every one of us, that, Lord, you minister to every one of us. And I thank you, Father, for what you will do. I just take authority over interference, over um, any, uh, anything that may try come to distract the word of God from sitting upon our hearts. And I thank you, Lord God, for an open heaven here today. In Jesus' name. And everyone says, Amen. Well, today is actually Pentecost Sunday. Woo! Some of us might be, what's that? That's cool. But uh, we're going to talk a bit about that because, uh, you know, it's important that we understand why we believe what we believe. For those of you who, who aren't familiar, Pentecost is actually one of the, the, the feasts, one of the Hebrew feasts that were, uh, were and still are celebrated by, by the, the Jewish people. And so uh, Pentecost is actually the fourth of the seven feasts. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that and why that is so significant and why, uh, you know, we need to even think about that or worry about that. And so what I want to say is that the actual, these seven feasts, before you all start thinking that I'm going to sort of, you know, grow some dreadlocks and, you know, put on some robe or something, you know, these feasts are actually a, uh, they're a prophetic declaration of God's timeline on connecting with God and and, and him displaying his glory to his people. And so we're going to have a look at that. In actual fact, the Hebrew word for feast is moed, and it can be translated as an appointed time or season. And why is that significant? Because if we have a look at the feast, so we basically got the first three feasts, and these were fulfilled by Jesus. We got the Passover feast, which we celebrate today as Easter, right? I think we all pretty much would understand that. And then you have the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, which is, uh, you know, celebrated uh, by, by the Jews as a feast on the second day. And then you've got the first of the, f- the feast, not the first, the Feast of the First Fruits. There's a bit of a tongue twister for you. And, uh, you know, and so what happens is the actual Passover is a, is a feast that marks the crucifixion or the death of Jesus, right? And so that's, that's one to, which uh, sort of, you know, is sort of pointing towards that. The unleavened bread is where Jesus was then, you know, buried in a cave. This is about the burial. And so we see the second feast is about us acknowledging the burial of, of Christ. And the, the third one, which is the feast of the first fruits, is really a representation of the resurrection of Christ. And so when Jesus came and died, and then he was buried, and then he rose from the dead, he actually fulfilled those first three fruits, uh, first three feasts. You'll have to bear with me. I'm still waking up this morning. Who's still waking up this morning? Who's looking forward to a coffee after the service? Don't worry, we'll get touched by the Holy Spirit, and that'll be enough to keep us going. So when you look at it from another perspective, you see, when Jesus died, we were given justification, which is a fancy word, meaning that... At the death of Jesus, when he died and paid the price for this, he made a way for us to be in right standing with him. And then we see we go through the process of sanctification, which means that once we are, we are in right standing with God, we go through this process of being uh, you know, conformed to the image of Christ, so to speak. Does that make sense? How many of us know that the moment that we became a believer and started following Jesus, we still had some issues that had to be dealt with in our hearts? And we go through that process of cleansing. That's called sanctification. And then we'll end up in a place of glorification where we are resurrected with him. But what happens is, why is all this significant? You're like, where are you going, Frank? I'm kind of confused. I didn't come here on a Sunday morning to hear all this deep theological stuff. Well, the point is this, that after the Feast of the First Fruits, which is celebrated, um, 50 days from there, we find the fourth feast, which is celebrated, which we call the Feast of Pentecost. But in actual fact, in the Jewish days, it wasn't called the Feast of Pentecost. We kind of call it that because, A, well, it was 50, Pente, 50 days after the, uh, the first fruit. So it was, you know, four, uh, seven weeks, which is 49 days, plus one day of the first fruits. And so we find ourselves 50 days later, we're at the Feast of the Passover. Uh, not Passover. Gosh, still waking up here. Of the Pentecost, right? And so we find ourselves at the Feast of the Pentecost. And in actual fact, this feast was called 
the Feast of Weeks because there were seven weeks. Or you can also, they call it, because it sort of was taken on in the Jewish uh, tradition as, as, as a time where uh, they call it the Feast of Harvest. Because what would actually happen is that uh, 50 days after when we end up on the time of Pentecost or harvest, that would be kind of where they then, uh, you know, have a feast and they celebrate. It's kind of like an open season. So on that day, that would then symbolise from their agricultural customs that then they could go and pick the harvest. They're able to go and reap the harvest that was grown. Why is that significant? Because when we were filled with the Holy Spirit, we were filled with the Holy Spirit, why? so that we could have a Holy Ghost celebration and roll around on the floor and feel good because we're shandarba, shandarba, shandarbas, yabadabadus. That's not why we were given the Holy Spirit. That may be an outcome of receiving the Holy Spirit, that we get touched by God and somehow that impacts us and he might manifest through us in a certain way. But that's not the reason we were given the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We were given the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Why? So we can go and reach people and minister to people and bring in the harvest for the kingdom of God. So what happens is we find ourselves that uh, during this time, we see that, you know, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, when you look at it from a prophetic uh, declaration, you see that Jesus came, he died, he was buried, he rose from the dead. Then they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they went into this time of harvest. We call the uh, the age of the church, I guess. That's where we're living now. And then this will lead us into the next three uh, feasts that are celebrated, the Feast of the Trumpets, the Atonement, and the Tabernacle. And that's all about the second coming of Christ and the end times, which we're probably not too far away from. So it's important for us to understand this, that things don't just randomly happen in the Bible. We don't just randomly think, oh, yeah, they got filled with the Holy Spirit. That's kind of a one-off thing, and that's praise the Lord. You know, that'll be cool. That might sound good. Let's do it. Like there's a purpose and a plan, and everything falls in line together. So we need to understand when we look at the Bible from the context of Old Testament and New Testament and all being fulfilled and joined together, we get the proper perspective. It's a bit like, um, you, know, uh, you know, I remember once I, I had a computer and, and it was a new computer, and I sort of turned it on, and I was configuring it, trying to get it going. And, and it looked good, and it was all right. And I'm like, yeah, this is pretty cool. Until I discovered that I could actually change the resolution of the screen and make it a higher resolution. And then everything seemed even clearer. Does that make sense? So it is important for us as believers that we're not walking through our Christian perspective, looking at this book just through our standard resolution. We need to look at it with eyes of, of high resolution. We need to see the, the high definition of all these things so it all comes to life. So we don't miss things because we just, oh, yeah, whatever. We'll just go with the flow. Does that make sense? So it's all part of God's plan to, to bring a fulfillment. And there are too many believers that, you know, just kind of accept these first three aspects of, um, of the feasts. Or, or the work of Christ, and kind of stop there. And, and they don't get to this point, and then they wonder why when they're walking between this point and the end times, they don't see fruit in their life. They don't see the, the, the God working through them like, like they would expect or like the Bible says. And they get stressed and wondering what's going on. You know, oh, this thing mustn't be real. We can't deny being filled with the Holy Spirit as, a, as an aspect of of God's plan for our lives. Does that make sense? And so this is really important. And so today, it is marking 50 days, which is the day, we call it the day of Pentecost, or, the, the, you know, we don't keep these feasts necessarily like, you know, the, the Hebrew people do. So we, we just call it the, you know, Pentecost Sunday. But we need to understand that today, is a celebration, a key celebration in our lives. We see Easter as a key celebration where we mark the, 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 the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And we also celebrate Christmas because, you know, well, the Messiah had to be born in order for him to come and fulfill these things. But we also need to celebrate the fact that this is the day of Pentecost where he filled us so that we could go and work out and live out this time 
of the church because he's waiting for us to fulfill his work. He wants us to do the things that he's calling us to do. Does that make sense? So if we have a look at this, you know, what, what, why do we need the Holy Spirit? Let's have a look at, uh, at Luke 3.16. Not John 3.16. This is Luke 3.16. And here we see that, uh, you know, John the Baptist is here and, 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 you know, he says, he answered them saying to all, indeed, uh, I indeed, I was thinking free indeed, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal straps I am not worthy to lose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, can you see how when we look at things through that high resolution, we start to see things pop out better. You see, normally you just read that scripture and like, oh, yeah, there's John the Baptist. He's baptizing people. And he's sort of saying like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. We baptize him and uh, that's all right. But, you know, just wait for the Holy Spirit because he's going to come and fill you. But now when you look at it through the lens of, of the fulfillment of the Old Testament and the New Testament combined together, if we just step back for a moment to that other, to that other um, screen we had on before, you see, death Burial, resurrection. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Anyone who's been baptized in water, who's done their teaching, who's sat through some classes to try and understand what does it mean to be baptized? We know that when we are baptized in water, we are identifying ourselves with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. So, so our um, baptism of water is really our personal identification of those three feasts. Does that make sense? And so, you know, if you've been baptized, you'd know that. If you haven't been baptized in water, then I just want to take a sidestep and take this opportunity to encourage you to seriously think about, um, you know, being baptized in water because it is an important part of our walk as well. Anyway, getting back to the sermon. So if we get back to that, uh, to that um, next screen that we had up there with the scripture of John, we see that John then, he instructed that, he will baptize you with the Spirit and fire. So we see that being filled with the Holy Spirit is not just, you know, whatever. Like John the Baptist is baptizing and he was doing some significant work of ministry. But he's pointing people to say, this is just one aspect of your faith. There's something else that's going to happen. And that is being filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's have a look at uh, another verse from Acts 1, verse 4 to 8. And Jesus here, he, he commanded his disciples to wait so that they could be filled with power. And, on, and on, from verse 4, it says, On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised. There's a bit of an insight there. The Holy Spirit, being baptized with the Holy Spirit, is a gift that we can receive. He says, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water. There's the reference back to that other scripture. But in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So he's trying to teach them the things of the Spirit, and they're trying to look at the physical things. But anyway, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So what we see here is, is Jesus pointing his disciples. I mean, he'd lived with them for three years and, and he was, uh, you know, encouraging them. He'd, he'd, he'd already fulfilled those, um, those feasts. And, and now he's speaking to them saying, now, wait, and you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. So they were waiting. And then on that day of harvest, then on that day that we call the day of Pentecost, we see that they got filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, it is important for us to understand that we need to wait and be filled. If we try and run forward and do things in our own strength without being empowered by the Holy Spirit, we're going to burn out. 
We need him. We need him to be working through us so that we could fulfill the things that he's called us to do. The truth is, why would Jesus command it if it wasn't needed? I don't understand. There are some Christian traditions who don't believe in being filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's okay. We're not here to judge anyone. We're here to just live according to what the Scriptures teach us. And as we saw through that prophetic timeline of, of those feasts, that you know, there's an element of being saved and, and, and being justified by faith, but then there's this other element of being filled with the Holy Spirit so we could go and reap the harvest that He's prepared for us. The truth is that God needs His church to have power. The truth is that without power, the kingdom of God cannot be fruitful. It might grow a little, but we're not going to see this exponential growth if we're not walking with the power of God within us. We're not going to be able to reap the harvest as intended without the fulfillment of being filled with the Holy Spirit. I I know some of you might be like, well, I don't know. Uh, You know what really stood out to me one day? I couldn't help but think of this illustration it was an event, but to use as an illustration, um, there was one time we were uh, at Rebecca's sister's house and, and they had a family over from overseas. And, you know, I got there a bit late and they were all just about to have um, dinner and uh, there wasn't really enough room at the table because there was a lot of people, <laughs> right? And some of Rebecca's got a big family and, and had these visitors and all that. And so we're all there. So me and this this kid, they had a son who was probably about 20, maybe 22, something like that. Me and him, there wasn't enough seats for us. So, you know, we, we, you know, hadn't quite done free indeed, but rejection wasn't a big issue at the time. So I said, hey, let's go outside and let's just sit there. So it was just him and me quietly eating on the outside table while everyone was inside. And we're having a chat and it was a God orchestrated moment because it was just him and I. He started opening up. I'm like, I, I didn't know this guy from anything. I just met him like literally five minutes before. And we're outside, we're chit-chatting. And I'm like, so tell me about you, what's going on? How's life? And he starts sharing with me how he's addicted to ice and addicted to all these substances. And he was like, just his heart was broken. He was crying. He's like, I want to get off these addictions. I've tried rehab. I've tried this. I've tried all this stuff. And he said, there's nothing I can do. I'm just addicted. I can't. He goes, I can't remember the day of waking up and not needing substance to get through the day. And I'm like, wow. And, and something happened, if I could backtrack maybe uh, a couple of weeks before that, when, you know, uh, uh, when I became a new Christian, I, um, I was still DJing in the nightclubs and people would come up and, and ask, you know, to play songs, uh, you know, make requests. And I'd say to them, like, hey, you come with me to church tomorrow morning and I'll play whatever song you want. And then they'd be like, church, and then I'd start, you know, ministering to them. And, you know, and there was one time, and sometimes people would come up and they'd say, oh, could you play this song? And I'd just start prophesying over them. And they're like, this guy, DJ, what's he talking about? And I remember one lady came up and she was like, oh, can you play this song? I said, ma'am, the Lord has called you to blah, 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 blah. And I said, you know, God is telling you this and he's called you to be a leader. And, he, you know, but you're using the leadership of gift that he's put upon your life for a wrong influence. And God is, is telling you, get back on track, get back to what it, and, and I started just prophesying as something on that nature. And she's like, I'm, not, I'm sure she was thinking, I just came to request a song. I'm like... <laughs> Anyway, so she walked off, came back about 10 minutes later and goes, uh, were you serious about all that stuff? And I said, look, I'm a believer. You know, I just speak what I felt God had spoken to me about you and I sort of tried to explain in a simple way, you know, we're not in a church setting, you know what I mean? So I'm trying to explain to her what it means to hear from God and, as a prophetic word and give to her. Anyway, that person, she almost started crying. She's like, oh, can I talk to you when you finish? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I finished my, my shift DJing and another guy was taken over. It must have been about three or four o'clock in the morning. So I went and sat down on a table and in the middle of the club, we're just chit-chatting and, you know, and I'm like, all right. So, and as not even a minute or two after sitting down with her, some guy comes up, flicks her some money and she flicks him some substance. And I'm like, do you see 
what that prophetic word meant. And I started telling her, you know, because obviously she was the drug dealer of that club. Anyway, and I started speaking into her life and, and I said to her something like, you know what your problem is? I said, you take substance to try and make you feel good and you feel on a high till the next day you crash down low. And then you crash down low, even worse than where you started. So you need more, so, and your life is up and down like a yo-yo. I said, I can give you a drug that will fill you and keep you filled, and it'll cost you nothing, and it'll get you high, and it'll be awesome. Anyway, I started touching. She's like, what, what drug? I'm like, you need the touch of the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, to bring, anyway, so that was fresh in my mind. And now I'm talking with this guy at this uh, dinner thing, and I'm talking to him, and he's like, yeah, and I'm, he goes, I don't know what to do anymore. I said, uh, have you tried asking God to help you? He's like, what? I'm like, yeah. So I just started telling him about, you know, what it means to be saved. I gave him a quick, like, you know, five-minute thing as to the gospel message. And then I shared about, you know, and then, you know, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then as the Holy Spirit will work with you, he will guide you because you can't do it in your own strength. You need God to help you. You need the Spirit of God to push you through, to take you through that process. And so as I started sharing this, he's like, yeah, and and – you know, shortly after, it must have been a 20, 25 minutes, like, let's do it now. I'm like, oh, okay. So we sort of, uh, you know, just started, um, I, I said, all right, we'll repeat after me. We said a prayer. And then I said, all right, and then Lord God, you know, I said, we're just going to pray. You repeat after me, you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he's like, yeah, yeah. So we prayed and da, da. And then next thing you know, boom, he got filled with the Holy Spirit. He started speaking in tongues and he started doing all this stuff. Anyway, it was like an amazing moment. And then I remember about, you know, it must have been about five or ten minutes that we were like, you know, uh, this thing's happened. I'm like, oh, I forgot to explain to him about what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I just told him, you get, this is what it means to be saved, and then you can ask the Holy Spirit, and he'll feel bang. And he just started speaking in tongues. I didn't even mention, to, I didn't even tell him about what that looked like or what it meant or anything. I mean, in five minutes, I, I talk a lot, but how much can you say in five minutes? You know what I mean? Anyway, and it was a one, one experience that I saw. That made me uh, just really come to understand the reality of, of what it means to be filled with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Because if you haven't explained to someone about it, and then it just starts happening, it kind of brings it to a reality. Do you, do you know what I mean? And so anyway, the point is that Jesus commanded them to wait. Because when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we then receive power the scripture says that it says, but when you receive power, uh, sorry, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And so we have this supernatural power that comes upon us, not so that we could feel good, not so that we can take the glory. The glory belongs to him. It's not so that we can point people to us. Oh, come to me because, you know, I'm an amazing minister of God and I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. And, you know, you can, uh, you know, do whatever and, you know, come and bow down to me. Uh uh uh. He'll rip that lampstand out from you quicker than you can say lampstand. I had to think of a word. The point is, he's empowered the church to have power. Why? So that we could reach out to people and point them to him. So we receive power of the Holy Spirit. Why? So we can lay hands on the sick and they will be healed. Why? So that we could uh, speak words over their life that's going to point people to God. Why? So that we could help people see the truth of who God is. Amen? And so this is an important aspect. But the other aspect is, for those of you that are wondering, is this just a one-off event? You know, the, the work of the Spirit is flowed out throughout the whole Bible. See, let's have a look at... Uh, the next slide. We see that in the time of creation, in Genesis 1, chapter 2, it says, Then the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So we see that in the very beginning of the Bible, that the Spirit of God was there. If you keep reading, you'll see, then God spoke. So what we actually see happening here is the Spirit of God is already present at work. And then God spoke. So we see the Word of God and the Spirit of God come together, and together we see, talk about a big bang. It's called creation. And so we see that happened here in the beginning. And then we fast track throughout the Old Testament, get to the beginning of the New Testament. We find ourselves in the book of Acts, and in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, it says, And they were all 
filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. And the Spirit gave them, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then we see, if you read the rest of that chapter, verse 41, then those who gladly received his words were baptized. There we see the baptism again. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to the kingdom. That's the power I'm talking about. So what had happened here is, is that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then Peter got up and began to speak the Word of God. So we see once again the Word of God and the Spirit of God colliding together. And we see pum, power, 3,000 people added to the kingdom. Now, there's a lot to all this. Because remember I said you could look at things in, you know, standard definition or we could look at it high definition. You know, you look at it on the surface, you think, oh, that's awesome. You got filled with the Holy Spirit, 3,000 people got saved. Well, if you look into the details of it and combine the Old Testament with the New Testament and look at it from the big lens, what you'll see is that back in Exodus 32, when the law was introduced and people were worshipping golden calves and they were doing all this stuff and they turned their backs on God. And then, you know, God was like frustrated, upset that they, they, they turned their back on him when Moses came down with the law and he went to introduce the law and he saw that they were like not honouring God, in, stuck in idol worship. And what happened? Those people that had turned their backs on God, that turned to other gods and idol worship and worshipped that golden calf, they were killed and 3,000 of them died that day, swallowed up in the earth. So we see that back in Exodus 32, 3,000 people died when the law was introduced. Now we see the restoration power of God, where the Spirit of God and the Word of God combine together. And together we see a restoration of what happened back then when the law was introduced. And we see 3,000 people getting saved as a restoration of what had happened back in those days. So God's saying, it's cool. We're doing this new. We're starting again. And so we see that it happened. And you're probably wondering, you know, if you read the first part where it says, you know, that there was, you know, it came down like tongues of fire and, you know, mighty winds and all this stuff. You know, when Moses, before Exodus 32, probably back around about Exodus 19, he went up to hear from God and he, and he saw the burning bush. So we see the fire. And then it says that, uh, you know, fire came down from heavens and there was like, you know, thunder and lightning and shaking of the mountains. This is a, again, the New Testament aspect of coming to life back with what had happened back then. There was an old saying that I've reworded. It's what DJs do. We remix things. And it says this, the word with no spirit, if you have the word of God with no spirit of God, well, you're going to dry out. See how I've changed it a bit? But if you have the Spirit of God without the Word of God, well, you're going to blow out. And if you have the Word of God and the Spirit of God, you can reach out. Isn't that cool? Do you like my remix 12-inch version? Well, I could. Oh, we don't have a lot of time, so we better just... Uh, we'll save that for warnable. Uh... Anyway... What else do we know? You might be like, well, you know, was this a one-off thing? No. This has happened many times in the Bible. In the New Testament, after this account of, of the, the day of Pentecost when they got filled with the Holy Spirit, we see that many people, you know, were, were, were filled with the Holy Spirit. So let's have a look at the next slide. And you'll see that, like, you know, Jesus, when he appeared to them uh, after the resurrection, you know, he actually indicated to them in Matthew 16, 17, he said, they shall speak with new tongues. He instructed that they will be filled with the Holy Spirit and they will speak with new tongues. This is Jesus telling them what would happen. And then we see in Jerusalem, in what we just read, they got filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with tongues. Then we see in Samaria, in Acts 8, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 9, we see that Saul in Damascus got filled with the Holy Spirit and scales fell off his eyes. Then we keep reading in Caesarea, we see that the Gentiles were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke with tongues. And then we see in Ephesus, as we keep going, that they spoke with tongues and prophesied in Acts 19. And we start to see the fulfilment of Jesus speaking to his disciples and say, wait, for you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit and then you'll be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And this is what happens. As we get filled with the Holy Spirit, we're able to be used as vessels for him to minister to people. 